All right, and I'd like to uh, read to you some quotations from leading postmodernists of the uh, late 20th century and uh, make some connections between those quotations and some of the themes I've been putting up here in abstract form. First one uh, from Michel Foucault, uh, French postmodern thinker, uh, quotation, it is meaningless to speak in the name of or against reason, truth, or knowledge. All right, so here the key theme uh, Foucault is attacking is uh, the notion of reason. What he's saying is that it's meaningless to speak on behalf of reason, but it's also speak, uh, meaningless to speak against reason. Right? Uh, we are so skeptical that the issue of reason status and so forth is just not, not uh, even on the cards. But along with reason, uh, Foucault mentions truth uh, or knowledge. Right? Truth is a meaningless concept. Uh, knowledge right, is a meaningless concept. And the idea has been that uh, uh, prior to a radical kind of skepticism, truth uh, meant something. In some sense, there's a connection between what goes on in our heads and the way the world actually is. Or to speak of knowledge, this is to say that we have a certain cognitive orientation to the way the world is. But the radical skepticism that Foucault is embracing here that is characteristic of the postmoderns uh, indicates that that is just completely pointless. So that is uh, entirely out. Uh, next quotation I'd like to read is from Stanley Fish, uh, an American uh, postmodernist. Uh, quote, uh, sorry, not quote, deconstruction, just uh, introducing the label here. Uh, Fish was a pr primarily a literature professor, and a deconstruction is a literary method that the postmodernists develop for analyzing and uh, breaking down texts. This is what uh, Fish is saying about deconstruction as a, as a literary method here. Deconstruction, quote, relieves me of the obligation to be right and demands only that I be interesting. Now again, we have an epistemological theme here. What we're saying is there is no such thing as right uh, if deconstruction is true or if the postmodern critique of traditional uh, epistemology is true. There is no such thing as right and wrong. Uh, and so what we're not trying to do when we're interpreting pieces of text is figure out what's the right interpretation or what's the true interpretation. It's just a story, right? We're just talking here about narratives. And when we're talking about stories that have been made up or narratives that have been made up, we're not asking is, are these true? Because we know that they're stories that are just made up. Instead, what we're looking for from narratives, what we're looking for from stories is that they engage us, that we find them interesting. The person can tell a good story, an interesting story. And so what Fish then is arguing is that postmodernism is not then about what's right, uh, but rather about what's uh, an interesting narrative and what's a different narrative. And instead of objective criteria, uh, what's, what's interesting and so forth is, uh, is more subjective, it's more uh, 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 non-objective, and so we're just interested in subjective play, right, more primarily here. All right, now, other postmodernists, though, will take things in a darker direction. Uh, and my next quotation, actually, I have two quotations here from Andrea Dworkin. Uh, Andrea Dworkin and her colleague in law uh, uh, made arguments against censorship on postmodern grounds, or sorry, in favor of censorship of certain kinds of post pornography, rather, on postmodern grounds, arguing that. Pornography is a certain kind of narrative, it's a certain kind of story, but it's a story that portrays conflict, or that it portrays males in a dominant role and females in a submissive role, and as a result of the prevalence of pornography, uh, males and females are constructed to have certain kinds of gender roles that are detrimental to females and serve to pop up the male-dominated patriarchal society that postmoderns think we have. And so censorship of pornography was, uh, was a legitimate pose here. But what I want to uh, focus on in these two quotations is Dworkin's claims about the nature of relationships between males and females. But because the language is very strong here and I'm a delicate-souled person, I won't actually read them out. We'll just have them flashed on the screen here.
All right, now notice what uh, Dworkin is doing here is defining individuals by their group membership right in the first place. You are a male or you are, you are a female and arguing that the relationship between those two groups is one of conflict right, and oppression. Right? Males and females, contrary to the modern claim that it's all about women's empowerment and women's liberty and that we're making progress toward uh, women's equality. The argument here is that that is just a good news story. It's a cover story that masks uh, the, the real brutal truth of the matter, which is still that males are, uh, are, are primed and conditioned to dominate women and women, uh, the, 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 the contemporary narratives, including all of the porno pornographic narratives, are trying to reinforce that narrative uh, and, and prop up the continued oppression of women by males here. All right, next quotation from uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard, a French postmodernist. Uh, he is the one who, uh, in a book called The Postmodern Condition, uh, came up with the, the label that came to be widely associated with the postmodern movement. Uh, he is also the one who uh, uh, came up with the, the emphasis on on, on, on narratives uh, and the, the, the theme of being incredulous toward any meta narrative is a, a formulation that comes from Leotard here. But also in focusing on this issue of group membership being primary, conflict and oppression being dominant, uh, take this quotation here it's from the early 1990s. Quote Saddam Hussein, the former dictator of Iraq, is a product of Western departments of state and big companies, just as Hitler, Mussolini, and Franco were born of the peace imposed on their countries by the victors in the Great War. Saddam is such a product in an even more flagrant and cynical way, because the Iraqi dictatorship proceeds, as do the others, from the transfer of problems in the capitalist system to the vanquished less developed or simply less resistant countries. All right, so now we have a number of themes here. What we have is this theme of, on the political grounds, capitalism is a system that says it's in favor of liberty and equality, uh, and the capitalists can tell a good news story about that. But what is really going on is the traditional Marxist story of there being uh, oppression, there being exploitation, but what the capitalist countries have been able to do is take all of their conflict and, and, and exploitation, all the problems that develop from that, uh, and export them right, to third world countries, to weaker countries such as Iraq. Uh, and so capitalism's pathologies are masked or hidden or swept under the international carpet, so to speak. Uh, and it is then the third world countries that are bearing the brunt of this. So what we then have is rich countries versus poor countries or strong countries versus uh, uh, weaker countries here. It's those groups uh, in conflict uh, on, on an international scale. So it's not simply males and females or members of different races. It's different ethnic groups, different economic groups on a worldwide scale. But also notice what he says about Saddam Hussein, that particular dictatorship. Uh, his situation is a constructed right, situation. It's not that he made certain choices and the Iraqis made certain choices. Rather, they are puppets being controlled by Western uh, governments, by Western big companies, uh, and so their situation is, uh, um, um, is, is something that is imposed on them. They are determined, they are constructed by the international political and economic environment that they find themselves in.